Good evening. I'm John Batchelor. This is the John Batchelor Show. The President of the United States, in remarks to the media today, spoke ironically, I presume, reports or references or um, expressions of my demise are greatly exaggerated. That's a combination of several famous sayings in American history, but it has to do with the second term of the Obama administration and the domestic agenda. Chiefly, we can think of health care, the Affordable Care Act, and we can also think of immigration. Larry Kudlow, the host of Kudlow Reports at CNBC and Kudlow Radio Across the Nation on the weekend joins me. Larry, a very good evening to you. You address both the story of the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, health care, and immigration tonight in your program on CNBC. I want to start with health care because Governor Howard Dean was with you. And you were very generous and patient with Governor Howard Dean, who was speaking aspirationally with only a few months to go to the national exchanges that have to be ready for all the states that don't have their own exchanges. Were you comfortable with Howard Dean not responding to you that the Obama administration's not ready. They're just not ready. You kept saying it, and the governor wouldn't return a, a fair remark. Good evening, Larry. Good evening, John. Well, you know, Howard Dean, uh, basically his position was that in states where they're setting up the exchanges, and he wasn't sure how many there were, maybe a quarter of them, they're going to be okay. But he kind of acknowledged that the federal exchanges are not being set up. And that's what prompted the remark by uh, Senator Max Baucus, who was the sponsor of the bill way back when in 2010, when Baucus said it was a train wreck. What he's referring to is the fact that these uh, insurance exchanges are not getting fixed. They're not, there's no infrastructure, there's no money. And as Betsy McCoy said, uh, <clears throat> people, uh, there's no choice. There's no real choice except how much um, premiums you're going to have to pay or, or how much um, deduction deductibles you're going to have to pay. So, you know, Howard had the story about one quarter right, and that's all. I mean, the problem here is twofold. Number one is these exchanges, which will not be ready by October 1st. I kept saying that. It's only five months. They're not going to be ready. All right, that's it. And secondly... There's about 40 million people, depending on who you're, you know, talking to in Canada, there's about 40 million people who are going to have their health care insurance displaced, either because small businesses don't want to pay for it, uh, 50 employees or more, or they don't want the work week to be 30 hours, or young people uh, who might have a policy and they don't want to make a more expensive policy because premiums are going up. There's at least 40 million people that are going to be displaced. They're not going to be able to see their doctors. Uh, they're going to lose it from the company if the company is self-insured. And so right now we are nowhere near uh, being ready for Obamacare. That's the bottom line. Well, Larry is pointing to a piece, and he referenced it on his show, by uh, Professor Kessler, a professor at Stanford University, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Wall Street Journal. 30 to 40 million people damaged in some fashion by the Affordable Care Act. More than one in ten Americans. Full stop, because we also have to deal with immigration, which is the unfinished business of the Obama second term. You spoke to uh, Senator DeMint, former Senator DeMint, now the head of the Heritage Foundation tonight about immigration. And Larry, he focused in his rejoinder to you on secure our borders. What is disappointing to me in that remark is that it presumes that we just have one kind of immigrant coming from the Mexican border or coming in from Central America. Uh, in a, a little while, we'll speak of Asian Americans that the New York Times reports are the new majority minority in many parts of Southern California spreading into America from Taiwan from Singapore, from the mainland China, from Hong Kong, from Thailand. And those are very different than people you can secure our borders and satisfy. I don't think Senator DeMint is remarking at the scale of immigration in this country. I think he's stuck on an old model, Larry. Well, he, he probably is. He's, he's stuck on the Mexican-Latin American model, and which is a model essentially of you know, lower income, poor people coming across the right. border. And, uh, yeah, I recognize that. Demet, however, I'm going to give him credit because he made one point today, which I've just realized because I was doing some reading. Um, the argument that uh, Senator Rubio is making that you're not going to get any government assistance plans, whether it's welfare or Medicare or Obamacare, for uh, 13 or 14 years. Turns out they've discovered a loophole. There's a big story up running now 
on various uh, blog sites. They discovered a loophole, Senator Jeff Sessions, the ranking uh, Republican on the Budget Committee, and they could they could come in and get assistance, uh, welfare, and so forth right away. And so that's a loophole that has to be plugged. And Jim DeMint was very skeptical about that tonight, and I give him credit. He's a very crafty, he's a very smart guy. Where I disagree with Jim DeMint, though, is that I think all immigrants coming to the United States creates economic growth. I think they build businesses. I think they wind up being innovators. They pay their taxes. And on balance, I think we make money. We get more revenues, uh, not fewer revenues. And that's always been my view. I'm a growth and opportunity guy. I understand there are a few bad apples, but basically, um, as some studies have shown, they contribute the benefits of their contribution uh, far, far exceeds the cost. And I think that that's an argument that the Heritage Foundation is going to try to support, and I think they may wind up losing that argument. In addition, uh, the economy. There were remarks over these last days since we last talked, Larry, that there's a sense, and I saw Mohammed El Arian of PIMCO pointing to a slowdown, that the swoon is widespread. It's not just about manufacturing or retail numbers or consumer confidence. It's widespread. There's a sense that the economy is seizing up in some fashion, though it's not housing this time. I heard that from your show tonight. I also heard the fact that this is very much uh, the evening before the Fed is going to publish more remarks. What do you expect from the Fed in 24 hours. I think the Fed is going to acknowledge two things, both important. One is that the inflation rate is going down, not up, and is way below their target. It's actually 1% inflation. They'd prefer 2 plus. Secondly, we've seen some weakness in retail sales. We've seen some weakness in durable uh, goods orders, business investment. Um, housing's good. Actually, consumer confidence was up today. But we've seen weakness in consumer spending, and we've seen weakness in business investment. And I think from talking to former Fed Governor Rick Mishkin about this, the Fed's going to put it in their directive. They're going to mention these two points on inflation and on some sluggishness in the economy, um, and also the 88,000 jobs was pretty weak. Now, what that means is that people waiting for the Fed to slow down their money creation are not going to get it. In other words, there's a little worry in Wall Street that maybe by the summer or the fall, the Fed is going to stop buying bonds or they're going to slow down their bond purchases. I don't think that's going to happen. I think as soon as the Fed puts this stuff in their statement tomorrow on inflation and uh, some sloppiness in the economy, you're going to see the markets respond and they're going to say, well, no Fed tightening or no Fed slowdown or any of that stuff. It's going to go on for quite some time. <clears throat> I reckon with some better earnings reports that we've seen, that's going to be very, very bullish for stocks. Very bullish for stocks. In addition, bullish for stocks, because we rarely get to talk about a single issues, but Apple is, you know, a way Apple's of talking about job. the best part of American economy. Apple issued debt today, and that is seen as bullish. Is that correct? Yeah, it is, because Apple's really bolstering their dividends. In fact, their dividend is just about as high as the bond rate. And secondly, they're going to have a lot of buybacks. So Apple is really catering to its investor base. And I think that puts a floor under the stock. It's actually appreciated somewhat and um, will make it a much more attractive issue. It helped the market today. Larry Kudlow of Kudlow Reports at CNBC and Kudlow Radio. Across the nation on the weekends, I'm John Batchelor. This is The John Batchelor Show.